Let us read God's holy word in John 5, verses 1 through 26. John 5, beginning at verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem, by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, a blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? <coughs> the impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man, when the water is troubled, to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day, it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed, and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward Jesus findeth him in the temple, and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The man departed, told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he saith the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son that all men should honour the Son, even as they honour the Father. He that honoureth not the Son, honoureth not the Father which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, and believeth on him that hath sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Amen. Amen. 
Our text this morning is John 5, verses 19 and 20. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. Beloved, in its simplest division, you could say that John chapter 5 consists of two parts. First of all, we have the narrative of Jesus healing of the paralytic on the Sabbath. That's the first 18 verses which we covered in the first three sermons of the series. And then second, we have the discourse on the Son's works and witnesses in verses 19 through 47, the rest of the chapter. And those who have a Bible that has the words of Christ as coming from his lips in red, verses 19 through 47 is almost all red. And the question is, what is the connection between the narrative in the first 18 verses and Christ's discourse in the remainder of the chapter? Now, when you first read it, or possibly on your second or third reading or whatever as you've gone through the Bible on your own, you're tempted perhaps to think, really, there's no relationship. There's this miracle that comes at the start of the chapter, the first third, as it were, and then there's a discourse which immediately follows it, but apart from the immediately following it bit, there's really no connection. Upon further reflection, and you should be there already, you realize that there is some relationship beyond <coughs> verse 19 coming after the first 18 verses. Because they deal, both sections, with the Son and the Father and their works. So there's some connection. And then with further thought, and with the help of this sermon and succeeding sermons, Lord willing, you will see that there is an intrinsic relationship between the two parts. In fact, verses 19 through 47 couldn't really come anywhere else in all the Bible but the bit where you find it here in John 5. And so when verse 19 says... Then answered Jesus and said unto them, he's responding to the charges made against him for the work that he has performed in the first 18 verses. He has healed the paralytic on the Sabbath day. They've charged him with claiming equality with God. And now Jesus gives a wonderful explanation and defense of his miraculous work and his amazing claim. And we're going to see this in this sermon, especially in the second point, and in subsequent sermons in this series, Lord willing. And the purpose of this sermon and the succeeding sermons is that found at the end of verse 20, that ye may marvel because if you understand this passage right you're going to say this is amazing this stretches my mind i think i only taste a little of this lovely food i only get a tiny understanding of the depths that jesus is teaching us here let's consider then this word of god in john 5 19 through 20 but before we get into it I need to explain the sense in which John 5 speaks of the Father and the Son. 
In this passage, the Son is especially the incarnate second person of the Godhead. The Son is Jesus Christ, who is, of course, fully God and fully man. He is the Son here. And the Father is the Father of the Son, the incarnate Son of God, namely the triune God. And then secondly, the relationship between Christ, the Son of God in this passage, and the Father, the triune God, this relationship reflects the eternal relationship between the first and second persons of the Blessed Trinity. And then when this passage speaks of subordination, the subordination of Christ the Son to the Trinity, when we work backwards from Christ to the eternal Son, we remove all subordinationism from the eternal sonships of the second person with respect to the Father. Now, there's something else you may have noticed. There is no reference to the Holy Spirit as such in John 5. You can look at the narrative, which we've read a few times, the first 18 verses. He is not there. There's no reference to him as such in the discourse found in verses 19 through 47 either. This is not because, and you would never have dreamt of such a foolish idea, this is not because the Holy Spirit is unknown to John's gospel. Chapter 1, verse 32, John the Baptist declares, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode upon Christ at his baptism. <coughs> verse 33 goes on to refer to the Spirit again. Jesus speaks about the Spirit in John 3. He tells Nicodemus, verse 5, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He explains that more fully in the next three verses. John 3, verse 34, declares... He whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto Jesus. So why then is the Spirit as such mentioned in John 5? Well, the Spirit here is not the subject. It's not the topic. Jesus doesn't here say anything about the nature of the resurrection body or a whole host of other things. You can't deal with everything in all times. The Holy Spirit isn't the subject in John 5. Christ treats one topic at a time. And there's a way in which you need to grasp, especially the relationship between the Father and the Son. You need to grasp that first before you can go more deeply into the relationship between the Father and the Son on one hand and the Spirit and His rule in the other. With those things said, by way of introduction, let's consider now John 5, 19 and 20, under the theme, the works of the Father and the Son. First, the glorious principles of the works of the Father and the Son, and then the contextual relevance of the works of the Father and the Son here in John 5. We begin with a simple, clear thesis that summarizes much of our text, namely, the works of the Father and the works of the Son are co-extensive. The works of the Father and the works of the Son are co-extensive. That's the key word now. And John 5, verse 19, teaches this 
by way of two statements. Regarding the Son's works, verse 19 says, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. And regarding the Father's works, Jesus goes on to say, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. That is, everything that the Father does, the Son does. And everything that the Son does, the Father does. Or to put it in the negative, there is absolutely nothing that the Father does that the Son doesn't do too. And there's absolutely nothing that the Son does that the Father doesn't do. That one word is key. The works of the Father and the works of the Son are co-extensive. The statement with which I began this section. And this is the express teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I say unto you. I say. The son can do nothing of himself. But what he seeth the father do. For what things soever the father doeth. These also doeth the son likewise. The works of the father. And the works of the son are co-extensive and Jesus here is in deadly earnest he's uttering solemn truth before his accusers who are desirous of killing him for the ultimate blasphemy verily verily that's amen amen so be it verily verily truth truth I say unto you the son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the father do for what things soever he doeth these also doeth the son likewise you must be absolutely assured that the works of the father and the works of the son are co-extensive and then Jesus sharpens and develops this truth in the next verse he uses the word all so that there is no ambiguity and no possible way of misunderstanding him. Verse 20 begins, For the Father loveth the Son and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And therefore the Son, seeing these things that the Father shows him, and doing these things, therefore the Son performs all the works of the Father, bar none. The Father created the universe. So too did the Son. I mean, just think of it. A human being standing before these ungodly, persecuting Jews and telling them that. I perform all the works of the Father. I performed the creation of the world. All his works. I did and do. The Father upholds the universe. I do too. The Father governs the universe. Guess what? I'm doing it right now. Just as I have done from the creation itself. The Father sent the worldwide flood I sent the worldwide flood the father destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone from heaven the son did too the father redeemed Israel from Egypt I was there I did that the son you see performs all the works of the Father. Now someone might say at this point, what about the incarnation and cross of Christ? Is that the work of the Father? 
Surely that's only the work of the Son. And the truth that needs to be explained here is that the Son is the only person of the Godhead who personally took flesh upon himself and died on Calvary for our sins. But the Father is involved in this intrinsically because the Father planned it and sent the Son to do it, to become incarnate and to die on the cross for us. Just as, for sake of completeness, the Spirit gave conception to the Blessed Virgin Mary and prepared Christ's human body and soul for his divine assumption of it. And then, having taught that the works of the Father and the Son are coextensive, and underlined it with the word all, all that the Father does, the Son does, Jesus mentions even greater future works, which had not, at that point, 2,000 years ago, happened in time and history. Verse 20 not only says, The Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that he doeth, but it adds, And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. And these greater future works that the Father shows the Son, and the Son sees, and therefore does, include all sorts of wonderful things. Soon after John 5, a matter of a couple of years or so, the future greater works of the Son <coughs> include not only his dying for our sins, but his resurrection from the dead, his ascension into heaven, and his session at God's right hand, that you may marvel. And then come other works of the Father and works of the Son. Remember, they're coextensive, and we're dealing with these ones that were future to the utterance of this discourse in John 5. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and the miracle. <laughs> of those in the upper room speaking in different languages so that the gospel can reach the hearers that day in <coughs> Jerusalem. And you remember that the people, the Jews there, marveled, wondered, how come they can speak in all these different languages in which we were born? And then comes another great work, consequent upon Pentecost, the gathering of the Catholic, that is, universal church, out of all kindreds, tribes, and tongues, which amazing work has been going on for some 2,000 years now, a work of the Father and a work of the Son. We'll explain more about the relationship, Lord willing, next week, because next week's text deals especially with that, the relationship between the work of the Father and the work of the Son. And of course, there are future greater works of the Father through the Son, to hint where we're going next week, greater future works of the Father through the Son that are future to us in the year 2023, including the second coming itself, I have performed great works. I, as the Son, the Father showed them to me. I will perform greater works, works that to us are largely now in the past. And I'm going to perform greater works as the Son, a work coextensive with the Father, when I return on the clouds of heaven, that ye may marvel. And even the ungodly will marvel, as Revelation 1 verse 7 says, that those who pierce Christ when they behold him will wail and lament. 
And the ungodly will marvel too in the language of Revelation 6 when they cry out to the mountains and to the rocks, cover us and hide us from the face of him that sits upon the throne. And then comes the general resurrection and the whole world will marvel. What am I doing? I'm back in a body and I'm raised, some will say, in a glorious body. And others will say I'm raised in a body clothed with shame and fitted for everlasting destruction. But you're going to marvel all right at greater works that the Father does and the Son will do. And then there's the work of the final judgment of the Father and the Son. When every knee shall bow to Christ and marvel. Marvel out of love or marvel out of hatred and consternation. And then comes the casting of the wicked into the lake of fire. And there were people to whom Jesus spoke these words in John 5. And they will be marveling when he says, Depart from me, ye accursed, into everlasting destruction and fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That was the one we saw and we rejected him. And then for others, everlasting marveling in the new heavens and the new earth. Now at the very end of verse 19 in our translation is the little word, Likewise, verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever the Father doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. And the likewise not only means that the Father and the Son do the same things, their works are co-extensive, but it means also in the same manner. So the Son does the same work as the Father in the same manner. And then how does the Father do all these works? Well, the Father creates, inspires the Old Testament, judges Sodom and Gomorrah, devastates Jerusalem through Nebuchadnezzar as a divine judgment and all the other things up to that point when our Lord utters these words. The Father does all these things with infinite wisdom an infinite power and infinite faithfulness to his promises and his nature. And the Son does the same work as the Father, <coughs> likewise, with infinite wisdom and infinite power and infinite faithfulness. And all of the divine attributes are wrought, are manifest in the Father's work of the salvation of the elect and in the Son's work of the salvation of the elect, with it all being of grace. And all of the works of the Father and the works of the Son are involved in the hardening and punishment <laughs> of the reprobate wicked according to God's perfect justice because not only are the works of the Father and the works of the Son coextensive, but the Son performs these works likewise to the Father. He does it in the same way and with the exercise of the same divine perfections. And here's a man standing in Jerusalem before his enemies who want to kill him. And he's making claims like these. And they understand it and they hate it. Then Jesus goes further. He explains that this is not only a matter of function. With the Son and the Father performing exactly the same works. Not only a matter of function. <laughs> with the Son doing nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do, and what the Father does, the Son does likewise. Not just a matter of function. The same works performed in the same way with the exercise of the same divine attributes. <coughs> because functionality could be out of all sorts of motivations. But this is all a matter of love. Verse 20. For the Father loveth the Son 
and showeth him all things that himself doeth. So the scripture here also teaches that the son loves the father the other way around, but that's an unnecessary point here. The passage is saying that the father loves the son, and out of love for the son, he shows the son all that he, the father, does. Verse 20. The father loves the son, And we could add, therefore, showeth him all things that himself doeth. And out of this same love, the Father will show the Son greater works than these, so that you may marvel. This raises the question, what is this showing? The verb is used twice, the same Greek word. What is this showing in verse 20. The Father shows the Son all his works. And that is hard to explain. We can say this much that it's not merely as if there's some sort of one big divine blueprint given to the Son, let's say at the start, here's what you've got to do. We're not to think of it either merely that there's this plan and the plan keeps changing and the father ad hoc sort of modifies it and now now we're going to change the plan a little bit to this and oh yeah tomorrow's work's going to be a bit different from what what I proposed to you earlier but instead we're to think of it as constant revelation between the father and the incarnate Son, constant revelation out of the blessed fellowship and communion the two of them enjoy together. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14 says that the Spirit searches the deep things of God and reveals them to the apostles who reveal them to us through the Scriptures. Well, we could say the Spirit reveals the deep things of God to Jesus. So a Jesus enjoys constant revelation and communion with God and the Father is showing him, he knows the plan, and he's constantly showing him what he must do, what the will of God for him is all the way through his life. This showing then the showing of the Father to the Son, is a continuous divine disclosure, a perfect revelation of God's will to him who has the Father's entire confidence, so that the Son receives the intimate, loving knowledge of the will of God from moment to moment. I seek not my own will, verse 30 says, but the will of my Father which hath sent me. Proverbs 25, Psalm 25, verse 14 rather, says, The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. And that's applying to the people of God. God reveals his secrets to those who fear him, and he shows us his covenant. Well, in an infinitely higher sense, the secret of the Lord is with Christ, and he shows Jesus his covenant so that the Father reveals to the Son the works, and the Son performs the works of the Father coextensively, perfectly, faithfully, and out of love to the Father who loved him. And this is deeply mysterious and profound. And Jesus is saying these things so that we may marvel. So here, follow the thought of the text. 
The father shows the son all of the father's deeds. The son sees these works of the father. He beholds and he understands them. And then third, the son performs all the works of the father. This is what Jesus is telling these hostile Jews in John chapter 5. And their minds must have been exploding. We hated him and we wanted to kill him. And then he just keeps upping the stakes and making it worse. Which brings us, of course, to the contextual relevance. Because Jesus Christ is not here simply giving a theological exposition of the works of the Father and the Son in the abstract. Remember the context. The context, first of all, because we're going to look at three contextual issues, the context, first of all, is the raising of the paralytic at the pool of Bethesda, the miracle. Remember I said verses 19 to 47 are intrinsically related to the narrative in the first 18 verses. Verse 19, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. <coughs> you saw me, the Son, raise the paralytic. What you need to understand is it wasn't just me. The works of the Son and the Father are coextensive. The Father raised the paralytic to soundness of limb. And I only just saw what he was doing and he did it through me. Verse 20. For the Father loveth the Son and showeth him all things that himself doeth and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. I raised that man from his paralysis and this was the love of the Father coming to me empowering me to do it and I'm going to do greater works in the raising of the paralytic and greater works than all the works I've done heretofore and these are greater works of the Father and of the Son. Sometimes we say when someone's in a mess they're in a hole instead of getting out of the hole they dig deeper. And this is a real disaster. Don't do that sort of thing, beloved. But Jesus, so to speak, they are bringing charges to him and he is laying it out for them, line upon line, blowing their minds. And he says, yes, this is exactly what I mean. That's the first thing from the context, the miracle of the healing of the paralytic. Then comes the second thing which is the lesser of the two charges that the Jews brought against Jesus, that of Sabbath breaking, mentioned in verses 16 and 18. So now we're moving from the miracle as such to the day on which the miracle was created. Jesus, you have broken the fourth commandment. The last commandment of the first table of the law concerning our duty towards God. This is a terrible sin. Verse 18 uses the word broken. Jesus has broken the Sabbath. That's their charge. It's a false charge, but he's broken the Sabbath in their eyes. The word means they've, that he has loosed the Sabbath. He has dissolved it. He's totally destroyed the Sabbath day, ruined it. Against the very authority of God, who established it. And Jesus' reply, his answer, then answered Jesus and said unto them, he's responding to them, and 
particularly now we're concerned with the charge of Sabbath breaking, he says, well, verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. You see me, and I'm calling myself the Son, do this, Sabbath miracle, you need to understand the Father did it. <coughs> He's a Sabbath breaker then. The Father is. Because the Father did this work. Our works are coextensive. Do you want to call God a Sabbath breaker? For what things soever the Father doeth, these also doeth the Son. The Father did it, the Son also did it, and the Son did it likewise, with the same infinite power and wisdom and faithfulness. Charge the Father too with Sabbath breaking. For the Father loveth the Son, verse 20 continues, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. When I healed that paralytic, you must understand, I did it with the love of the Father resting upon me. And it wasn't, I did something evil, with the hatred of the Father resting upon me as a Sabbath breaker. And the word show here means, the Father showed me how to do it. And I did it. And surely if he showed me how to do it, and that was a sin, then he's to blame too. And he will show, the Father will show the Son greater works than these that you may marvel. The Father is going to show me greater works that also involve the Sabbath. In fact, the Father is going to raise me from the dead on a Sunday, the first day of the week, and change the Sabbath. And you're going to marvel at that too. And the work of the Father through the Son in Acts 2 is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the first day of the week. You think this is something. Healing this paralytic on the Sabbath. What if I pour out the Holy Spirit, the Son, doing a coextensive work with the Father on the first day of the week so that the Sabbath is no longer the holy day at all? What if I, the Son, in perfect unity with the Father, and Revelation 1 verse 1 makes this clear, what if I give the book of Revelation, the last book in our canon, on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, Revelation 1 verse 10 teaches, further making it clear of the change from the Old Testament Sabbath, Saturday, to the New Testament Sabbath, Sunday, when there's no word of a revelation of God like that to any Old Testament prophet on the Old Testament Sabbath. Marvel at that. What if I, the Son, doing the will of the Father, call the New Testament church to worship on this first day of the week, which the church does, in Troas, in Turkey, in Acts 20, and the church in Corinth does in 1 Corinthians 16 in Greece. Marvel at that. The contextual relevance. We've dealt with the miracle itself, and then the first charge of the Jews breaking the Sabbath, this brings us to the third contextual issue, Christ's claim to deity, which was the greater of the two charges they made against Jesus. Verse 18, the Jews sought the more to kill him because one, he not only broke the Sabbath, but two, he said also that God was his father making himself equal with God. 
And now we're not only dealing with the fourth commandment, we're dealing with the first commandment. The first commandment of the first table of the law, far worse than Sabbath breaking, the ultimate <coughs> blasphemy. I am equal with God. And Christ's response in our text, verses 19 and 20, is not to deny the charge that he had taught that he was equal with God. He affirms it. You are dead right, verses 19 and 20. And verses 21 and following, you're dead right. The rest of the discourse will explain this. But Jesus doesn't only affirm that he is equal with God, he also, and this was necessary too, he explains and clarifies it. Yes, I am equal with God, but not equal with God in any wrong sense that you might be thinking. For instance, if Jesus claims equality with God, uh, hypothetically here, does that mean there are two gods? No longer monotheism, one god, but ditheism. Two gods. Because it won't just do to say that Jesus is equal with God. Because the people might misunderstand that. And then if the Son is God and the Father is God. Well, what's the relationship between these two persons who are God? Is there any contact between them? The Father God, the Son God, no contact, or 100% contact, or somewhere in between, because there are dualistic religions, like the Manichees, there's a good God, and he's, he's light, and there's a bad God, and he's darkness, and the two of them sort of interface, and there's a slanted line where there's contact between them. If there are two gods, these people could be struggling. I mean, is there some sort of opposition between them? Is it 100% opposition or 1% or 50%? What are, we, what are we dealing with here? Or perhaps these two gods cooperate. They work together all of the time, some of the time, with some things, with most things, with a few things. So how is Jesus going to explain the activities of the Father and the Son? It's because the Son according to his divine nature, is equal with the Father in terms of the first person of the Trinity as well as the Son. How are we going to explain the activities of the Father and the Son? How are we going to explain the nature or natures of the Father and the Son? What they do and, and what they are. Are the Father and the Son sort of in opposition to each other or independent of each other well Jesus utterly disavows any opposition of the son towards the father or any independence of the son and the father instead Jesus teaches the utter dependence of the son upon the father that in accord with his human nature and in his office as mediator. Utter dependence of the mediator in all his works and in all his workings. Verse 19, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can, and that, that is the underlying, it's all about can, not, the Son cannot, the Son can do nothing, absolutely nothing because the Greek is stronger than our English version could carry the son can do absolutely nothing of himself he's not independent the son's not independent of the father the son can do nothing of himself the son can only do what he sees the father do for what things soever the father does these also doeth the son likewise not independent at all Utterly dependent. Dependent, yes. But Jesus is also teaching that he is God. He is teaching here, and in his statement, verse 17, my Father worketh hitherto, and I work. 
and in verses 21 and following, he is teaching the highest absolute intimacy of the Son with the Father. Because after all, how does John's gospel begin? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, towards God, the eternal Son and the eternal Father in fellowship. The Son was with God, and the Son was God. Deepest eternal intimacy. Jesus is God also because Jesus performs the works of God. All the works of God. For what things soever the Father doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son and showeth him all things that he himself doeth. And when Jesus teaches that he performs all the works of the Father, that means that he is God. Because any party that can do all the works of God is God. If there was someone who did absolutely everything that you did, that would be you. And if someone can do all the works of the Father, that person is God. And Jesus performed all these works of the Father using all the attributes of God. That's the word likewise in 19. For what things soever the Father doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise, using the infinite power, wisdom, and faithfulness of God. There's not two gods. There's one God. There has to be one God. Remember, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. So Jesus cannot contradict that. That is scripture. But he's teaching some new doctrine that these Jews had never grasped because they didn't understand the intimations of the Holy Spirit and the Son in the Old Testament. He's explaining it that he's God, that the Father's God. There are two divine persons in one God. There's a third person, the Holy Spirit. He's not the subject of this passage. Other pastors teach his full deity, but he's not treated here. One God, two divine persons, with the Father and the Son in perfect intimacy, performing works that are coextensive, using all the same infinite attributes of God, so that Jesus is really and truly equal with God, according to his divine nature. And Jesus tells them these things. He's very explicit about it. In verses 19 and 20. The son can do nothing of himself and so forth. The father will show the son greater works than these, etc. That ye may marvel. I'm not trying to sweep this under the carpet and make it prosaic. Something you can understand. I'm actually going to unfold it. To astound you. And you, the vast majority of them are going to marvel in unbelief because the truth is going to come and it's going to be like such brilliant blinding light that it's going to give you a headache and you're going to put your hands over your eyes and shut your eyelids closed and then get down beneath your bed so that it can't enter in. You're going to reject it. But there's also the marveling of faith and worship which I trust is your attitude this morning. And the subsequent sermons, Lord will, willing, will help us all to marvel even more regarding the Son and the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we ask that thou would help us and our children to open our eyes, the eyes of our hearts, by the power of the Spirit, that we may understand Pray over, seek more deeply to understand these things. And that thou, Lord God, would work worship in our heart at the stupendous, marvelous truth of the blessed Trinity. The God whom we worship through Jesus Christ alone. Amen.